morning. But Father God, we love, we love, love, love your presence. Father, come and just, just enter this place. Father, we, we say you are welcome here. And this morning, we're going to ride with you. We're going to ride with, with, with your ways, Lord God, with your heart, with your love, Lord God. We will ride. Yeah, he's got fire in his eyes, the sword in his hand. And he's riding a white horse across this land. He's got fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand, yeah. He's riding a white horse across this land. And he's calling out to you and me, singing, will you ride with me? Come on, church, let's sing it out together. Say, say a slow. We will stand up and fight, yeah. in his hand and he's leading God's armies across this land I said he's calling out to you and me saying church will you ride with me and we'll say yes Lord Lord and we will ride with you Just lift your heart up and say, say yes, Lord. We say yes to you, Lord. We say yes. One more time, let's say that. Come on, as a body this morning, as a family, we say yes. 
Yes, Lord. Come and have your way this morning, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yeah. Good morning. Oh, man, y'all can do better than that. Good morning. Welcome back to Sunday morning and welcome home. We're so glad you're here today. I got a few announcements for you. We want to let you know um, February uh, 22nd. We will have, sorry, I just logged out on my phone. That's that's horrible. I want to make sure I get these right. Um, we will be having our membership class. So if you call Community Church at home, but you're not yet a member, we're going to have a membership class directly after service, lunch provided. And so in order to do that, we need to get you signed up. You need to fill out a red card. You put that on there. We'll, we'll get in contact with her. You can go see Pastor Dan right after service outside the door. In addition to that, we have our starting point retreat coming up in March. And if you've been in the classes, we want you to come to the retreat. Come be blessed. Hear not only just the staff, but our, the, our leadership team of our church. And know what we're about and where we're going in the kingdom. So get signed up with Pastor Dan on that. And in addition to that, starting this Monday, we have our grief share at 630 here at Community Church. You don't want to miss out on that. If you got things going on in your life and you want to move on to the next phase and get past some things and have a community to support you in that, we've got the place for you. And that's Grief Share at 6.30 on Mondays tomorrow. All right. Well, let's pray and let's get started with our service. Father, thank you so much for everyone here. God, you are a good God. You are a good dad. And we gather here as sons and daughters to celebrate you to celebrate your freedom, and to celebrate the life and the abundance that you give us. Lord, we bless your name this morning. Thank you for the opportunity we have. In name I pray. Amen.
this morning and sing. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see. so good this morning. How great is our God. Oh, sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see so good. our minds on, on God and on his presence and on his goodness. We just want to take a little bit of time just to just to set our eyes and set our mind on him. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, I tremble like your presence, I'm shaken by the truth that you are God. No deed can bring you pleasure.
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, now let's worship His holy name, and sing like never before, O oh my soul, and worship His holy name. Just sing that together as a family. Sing. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. I sing like never before, O oh my soul, and worship. Sing that together, sing. Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, and worship his holy name. I sing like never before, oh my soul, and worship your holy name. Worship him together this morning. Say, worship, worship your holy name, God. We worship you. We worship your holy name. Who is like you, King of Kings? Worship your holy name. We honor you this morning. We honor you this morning, Jesus. We honor you this morning, Jesus. And the word says that when Jesus is lifted up, when the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all men to him. And this morning, I can't help but, but think that God is drawing us this morning. As the name of Jesus is being lifted high, he's drawing you, he's drawing me towards him this morning. In him is life. We just exalt him this morning, Jesus. Exalt the Lord our God. Exalt the Lord our God. And worship Gloria. 
yes, Lord. Exalt. feeling this for several weeks now you know I've hurt for family members I've hurt for dear friends I've hurt for those in our body who have been diagnosed with illnesses and I'm telling you I don't believe we're dealing with it the right way as a body I don't think I am because I'm allowing the hurt that I feel for my friends and my family to impact the way I approach the throne room. And I want you to hear, it's time for us to decide, are we going to settle for a spirit of heaviness? Or are we going to push into the courts of praise? I, I believe this is our call upon us. Do you know you have an inheritance? And the problem with an inheritance is you got to go take it. you got to get it. It may be provided for you, but... Jesus read from Isaiah 61 in Luke 4, 18 uh, and 19. But I want to read the verse that's not included in that. And this is the prophet Isaiah speaking all over the children of Israel, the children of the king, which you and I are. He says, to console those who mourn in Zion, in, in the presence, to give them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. God hasn't planted you and me in the field of mourning. He has planted us in the field of joy. He has called us to be stalwarts of faith, so I'm calling you, if you're like I am today, and you've dealt maybe with a couple of weeks now of just this feeling of a of a heaviness, of a burden, of, of unsettled issues, of trials. I want to implore you today. Let's press in right now. Let's, let's take off a garment of heaviness. And let us put on that garment of praise. Let's, let's put on our inheritance this morning. We're going to transition the worship right now to some praise. And I encourage you, press in. If it helps you to come to the front, then come to the front. Just don't stay where heaviness is. Let us move into that place. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit.
Thou want to scream it out from every mountain top. Your goodness knows no bounds. Your, yeah, go ahead. Y'all start clapping. That's good. Come on. Your mercy follows me. Your kindness fills my life. Your love amazes me. And I sing because you are good.
on, lift your voice. Say, I'm stirring up deep, deep wells. I'm stirring up deep, deep water. We're gonna jump in the river. Come on, we're gonna sing this one more time. Come on, let the joy bubble up inside of you this morning. I'm stirring up deep. this morning. God, you're good. You're so good this morning, Father. You're good, Lord. God, you're so good. We worship you this morning, God. We exalt you in this place. Be lifted up, God. Be lifted up, God. You're so worthy this morning. You're so worthy. Be high and lifted up, Jesus. Oh, God. Be high and lifted up, Jesus. Thank you, Father. You know, while we're rejoicing, I was just thinking, this is Communion Sunday this morning, and I had such a uh, this build up on the inside because I'm excited about communion. I'm excited about celebrating what Jesus did for us. You know, His goodness. I look back at my life and it says, you do these things in remembrance of me. And I look back at my life and I get excited because I know I'm not the same person I used to be. I'm not the same person I used to be 10 years ago, 15 years ago, right. 2 years ago, 3 years ago, a year ago, 6 months ago. Because of the goodness of God. Because of his goodness. And this morning when we take communion, let's celebrate his goodness. Let's celebrate the goodness of God, what he's done. It's something to get excited about. It's something to get excited about. And we do it in the remembrance of him and what he's done for our life. And his blood that was shed for us, the victory that he gave us. That's something to get excited about. Amen. Amen. With the ushers just standing, we begin to come and let's pass out the, the emblems this morning. Let's just continue to worship as they pass them out. We're going to rejoice in the goodness of God this morning. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You are good. You are good. Lord, you are good. Come on, let's, let's not disengage from, uh, I know people are walking around, and, but let's, let's keep engaged with God this morning, all right? Come on, let's just begin to just say you are good to him. In every circumstance, in every situation, he is good. Amen. You are good. Say, you are good. Lord, you are good. Lord, as one church, we say, you are good, Lord. And you are good. And you are good. And we celebrate your faithfulness, Lord. And you are good. And you are good, and you are good, Lord. Say, you are good, Lord, you are good. Your mercies are new every day. Say, you are good, Lord, and you are good. Your mercies are new every day, Lord, you're good. It's your good, Lord. Who can compare to your goodness, God? You're good, Lord. sing because you are good and I dance because you are good and I'll shout because you saved me Lord from myself oh, you're good and I sing because you are good and I dance because 
You are good, and I'll shout, Lord. You called me from darkness to light, and I'll sing because you are good, and I'll dance because you are good, Lord. I'll shout because you are good, Lord. You are good to me. You're good to my family, God. You're good to this church, Lord. You're so good to my friends, Lord. You're so good to my family, God. You're so good to this world. You gave it all. So we could be close to you, Lord. I kind of get excited when I think about what Jesus did. Can you imagine this picture? This is one of my favorite pictures of Jesus. He's with his disciples. He's done all these things. They've seen him feed the 5,000. They've seen him heal the blind. They've seen him raise the dead. They've seen those things. And then Jesus looks at them. And he says, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because he's going to send the comforter. That's a celebration for me. He's saying, it's to our advantage what took place at the cross. Folks, we're a blessed people. We're so blessed. God is so good to us. This morning as we, as we partake of communion, let's do it with a heart of celebration, excitement, enthusiasm for what he's doing in our lives, for the healing he's bringing in our lives, for the transformation that he's doing in our lives. That's the goodness of God at work. Amen? Amen. you bring, the forgiveness that you bring. Can I say this real quick, man? It's, I just feel like, you know, like just, there's just a really, um, a, a really open spirit, I don't know how to say that, but just for, for forgiveness this morning. And just, uh, just, I, I just feel like there's, that, that, that forgiveness just needs to be released uh, in, into this place this morning. That uh, you know, the, uh, Jesus talks about uh, you know before before we before we bring our gifts to God that we that we that we make things right, and communion is is all about relationship with each other, relationship with God, yes, but relationship with each other. So this morning, I just invite you, just if there's if there's unforgiveness in your life that you have towards somebody, that you that you would begin to to make those things right. If they're if they're not here, you know, um, I would say just just begin to. To speak forgiveness over them, you know, and to them, and uh, and if they are here, I, I would just invite you just to, to to get it right. This is a family. This is what it's all about. This is this is church, but church is family. Yeah, Amen. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, but you know. What I mean. It's a good word. 
Paul does encourage us to examine ourselves. He even says that if we're unwilling to forgive ourselves, to forgive that we lack forgiveness. So powerful. This morning as we take the bread, as we take the cup this morning, I want to encourage you. Let's do it with a joy. Let's do it with a excitement. Let's do it with a reality of life that's given to us through Jesus Christ. Can you imagine being with him? It says they were laying, they were around the table, and Jesus took the bread. And he said that he broke it and he blessed it. He says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Broken for you, Don. Broken for me. For you, Steve. For you, Jim. For you, for you, James. For you, Bill. How good is that? How good is that for you, Chris? That's his body that was broken. Father God, thank you. Thank you so much for the life that you give us. Thank you so much for taking and sacrificing for us, God. That we may have life and life more abundant. Thank you, God. We bless you this morning. Bless this bread as we partake. Let's eat. So then he took the cup, which represents his blood that was shed for us. I love, I've heard Pastor say it, I've said it before, I, I saw it. T.D. Jake says, put it above your head, because it's just all over you. It just covers your whole body. Amen? It just covers your whole body this morning. Lord, thank you for your blood. Thank you for your blood that was shed. Lord, for the forgiveness of our sin, God. Thank you so much this morning. We rejoice in the victory that you gave us. God, that we have life. You said we're a new creation. We no longer are the old person, but we're new. Thank you so much this morning. We bless this cup this morning. Thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, let's drink this morning. Let's do that. Let's just sing how good he is this morning one more time. Amen. Is that okay? Would you stand to your feet? Let's rejoice in the goodness of God this morning as we're here. Hey, y'all can still hold hands. We're good. Come on. It's a little bit hard, it's all right. And I sing because you are good, and I dance because you are good. is so good. You know, that's, it didn't work exactly like I'd imagined. I thought all the, the, the ushers that came forward were going to start dancing and turning, but, you know, it's okay. Hey, would you do me a favor before you sit down this morning? Would you greet someone this morning? Would you be family? We are family. Would you just hug someone's neck you don't know? Reach out of your comfort zone this morning. Thank you so much.
Amen. God is good. God is so good. If we could get our ushers, if you made it back, if you could, you already have. Thank you, Steve. Begin to pass out those things. It's time for our, our tithing offering this morning. I want to just to encourage you this morning. You know, if you ever done something that was just a whole lot of fun that you really enjoyed and you try to talk somebody else into doing it, and they just don't get it until they go do it one time, and then they just really get excited about it, like, that was the best thing I ever did. Would, would you do something? Would you look at, at giving like that this morning? Because I know God blesses so much. He is so awesome. When we, when we stretch ourselves, when we reach outside our comfort zone and we give, God's saying it's, it's a blessing. He returns it to us this morning. So I want to encourage you this morning as you get your, your offering ready, your tithing offering ready this morning, I want to encourage you, just, just give with a hope and heart this morning and see what God does. He's so good. If you've got your offering ready, would you just lift it up? Let's, let's bless it this morning. I just want to pray over our offering this morning, our tithing offering. I'm not going to do the, the, the thing there. Father God, we thank you this morning. You are so good. Lord, this morning we rejoiced in your goodness. We rejoice in who you are. We rejoice in the life you give. And Lord, this morning as, as we reach into our pockets, as we pull out a tithe, a portion of what you blessed us with this morning, and we give, I ask that you bless it this morning because you are good. Bless the giver, Father. Lord, there's probably those this morning who are worried because of strike. They're worried because of what's going on at work. I pray this morning that you bless them as they give this morning out of obedience. God, that they see that you are faithful. That God, that their job is not their provider, but you are their provider this morning. And Lord, we pray for those things that are going on. God, that you would just enter into the hearts of those men and, and those people who are making decisions. And God, that it'll come to a quick end. Thank you, Father. We bless you this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Well, while they're taking up the offering this morning, I just want to encourage you, if you're a visitor, first time here with us this morning, in the back of your seat, you'll see these little red cards. These red cards are a chance for us to connect with you. If you wouldn't mind taking some time just to fill that card out, I'll be at the table right outside the doors this morning. We have a free gift for you. We want to give it to you. If you're a member, you've been here for a while, you've had a change of address, please take time to fill that out. Also, if you've got prayer requests, things are going on in your life, you need prayer, I want to encourage you, fill it out. We want to, we want to believe with you. We want to pray with you. We want to see God move in your life. Amen? So if you would this morning, just take time to fill that out. It's, it's not just the fact that we give you a free gift, but it's a chance for us to connect with you, to invite you to be a part of our family and who we are here at Community Church. We are blessed people. Amen? Amen. Well, as they're continuing to uh, pick up the offering, and guys, I want you to know some great things are going on in our body. Uh, we're getting to expand some ministries and do different things. One of the things that we found is uh, last year we brought the youth over to this campus. And with bringing the youth over to this campus, it freed up some things. And in that time, you, you chose to uh, uh, sow 16th Street property into another body, and that has been very successful for them. And a blessing for us as well but one of the things that we found that's kind of a, a hiccup in that process is what do we do with our youth in small groups we're a small group church we believe in the value of small groups and life on life relationships and I went around the other day and Pastor Joshua has done a tremendous job of every week they were in small groups so I went around during small group time and I started finding uh, our youth uh, put in different various places I found youth in some hallways, which that wasn't bad. But then I found the youth in storage rooms, uh, under the bleachers. And now they weren't there unsupervised. They were there with their small group leader. Let me point that out. But, uh, you know, the small group leader gets up and they're wiping insulation out of their hair. And I, I'm just convinced that that is not the best environment for our young people to be having small group. 
at the same time as we're having them wear masks to keep asbos uh, asbestosis out. Uh, so what we've uh, done, I've talked to the board, and starting March the 8th, that is the second Sunday in March, we will be moving uh, our start time to 10 a.m. Now, before you panic too much, we will get out before noon. Uh, we're, we're aiming for 11.30 because I know that's really important for you football fans out there. Uh, we're aiming for 10 to 11.30, and what that does for us is it gives us the ability to have our youth small groups uh, on Sunday morning, and we can get them out from underneath the bleachers and into classrooms, which is probably really good. Aren't you glad for that? Good thing. The other thing that's going to happen is the uh, adult, the senior adults will uh, be launching uh, some uh, Sunday school and fellowship time from 9 till 9.50. Now, here's the real uh, kind of dance here at Community Church. If, for instance, this morning you didn't get here till 10, nothing changes for you. You know, it just... Uh, uh, if you happen to be here at 9.30, it just gives a little bit more time for fellowship, which we enjoy. So it's going to be good. We're going to uh, aim for 10 to 11.30, uh, starting on March the 8th. March the 8th. Uh, I hear often that uh, one of the problems that we have at community is our ability to communicate clearly. 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 And so I want to say again, March the 8th, 10 a.m. service time. Uh, also, uh, that'll be the second Sunday in March, starting not tonight, but next week, the second Sunday of every month, we will have a Sunday night worship service where we come together and really celebrate uh, God's presence. We want to host His presence. We want to press in. We want to see God moving in mighty ways. And so what I'm asking is if between now and then you'll be uh, in prayer about that service and making sure that we come to that with excitement in our hearts. You know what I felt the last couple of weeks about the spirit of heaviness? Is that the enemy will try to steal your worship from you. Have you ever been in a worship service where everybody else was singing and you're thinking, oh, I'm not into it today? You ever had that? Well, it's good that no one here has had that. Uh, uh, I've had that. And so if you're there and you're ever in that place, that's when we press in. That's when we, we don't allow ourselves to stay where we are. We get to make a choice and say, I'm going to reach into my inheritance right now and pull what belongs to me. And so that's what we did this morning as well. Uh, well what do we want to talk about? As we move forward, is those times that we reach into our inheritance and join what God's doing in the greater body. One of the things that we know is going on is uh, in February, I believe the 21st, 22nd, Regina, would you make your way up here? Uh, do we have a microphone? Uh, Reinhardt Bunky is going to be in Houston, and we have an opportunity to join uh, that ministry in preparation and also serving. And so Regina's going to come up and share a little bit about that. You gotta come all the way up here, though, because you, yes, yes. Okay, for those of you who don't know who Reinhard Bonnke is, he's actually from Germany, and he was called to the mission field in Africa in the late '60s, and there was a great move of God there. He started off in stadiums, and then it was ended up being like open air uh, meetings because there were hundreds of thousands of people there getting saved. Also, God just really moves in those places during those crusades uh, through healings and lots of breakthrough happening. And he is coming to Houston, Texas. Um, he is bringing his, his gospel crusade the 20th and the 21st, and Jesus Culture will actually be there with him leading worship. So that's going to be an awesome experience. It is free. There's no charge, but they're asking that you register, that you pre-register. You can go online to gospelcrusade.org, and there are some of these flyers out in the large commons if you want to pick one up. It'll give you the information. But they're asking that you um, pre-register so they can get a count of how many people are coming. Also, if you want to volunteer, if you want to be uh, a prayer partner or if you just want to volunteer to help put on the uh, crusade, you can do that as well. There's a place you can go on the website to register for that. The other thing they're asking is that you guys participate in a 21-day fast, uh, prayer and fasting, seeking God for breakthrough for those who are going to be impacted by this crusade. And so what I would like to ask, or we would like to ask here at Community Church, is this crusade may be coming to Houston, Texas, 
but we're asking for an outpour of the Holy Spirit to hit the South Texas region. And so we're calling you guys to, to commit to a 21-day fast with us that God would impact our church, our families, our city, our region, Southeast Texas, and, and on uh, into Houston and in throughout the state and the nation. Can we join together with other saints that are coming together right now in this region and they're fasting and praying for a move of God? Would you guys be willing to commit to that? Amen. And if so, I'd like to take it a step further. If you will commit to 21 days of fasting, will you just stand to your feet? All right. Thank you, Jesus. And let's just pray. Let's just pray and, and commit our next 21 days to the Lord. So, Heavenly Father, we just come before you, God. We are committed to you in these next 21 days to pray and to fast. God, I just ask that your Holy Spirit would reveal what it is you want us to fast from, God. But more than that, Lord, there are things, like Daniel said, there's a heaviness that has been on us, Father, and we need breakthrough. And prayer and fasting was an act that Jesus often participated in, Lord, and so we know that it's something that we are called to do. So today we commit to fasting, God, and we are believing you for breakthrough in our families. We're believing you for breakthrough in our finances. We're believing, God, that you're going to bring prodigals home, Lord. We're believing for salvations and healings and miracles, God, in this church, in this city, and in this region. And, Lord, so we join you, and we join together with the rest of those, God, who are called right now and who are fasting and who are pressing in, God. May our prayers be heard. May they shake the foundations of heaven. May heavens be opened and your Holy Spirit just Amen. pour out into this place. God, I ask for a spirit of evangelism to hit this church right now that we would go, Amen. Lord, and that we would bring you into the streets, Lord. God, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you and glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right, we have a great opportunity to, to be a part of what God's doing, and we want to encourage you as you fast. You know, the uh, Bible tells us that we... We, uh, we don't have to go around looking sad because we're fasting. Don't need other people to know it. So uh, what I encourage you to do is find something that uh, you can say no to so that you can dedicate that time. Uh, first time I fasted, I thought it was just about saying no to myself. So I said no to eating, and it was 24-hour fast. So I didn't know you could do anything else, and I didn't eat, and I planned ahead for not eating. Uh, have you ever done a fast where you planned ahead for fasting? And so I got up that night at 11.50 and ate a sandwich just in case. And I spent that whole day really aggravated because everybody else was eating while I wasn't eating. And the whole time I wasn't eating, I wasn't pressing into God. I was lusting after that donut and the food and everything else. And that night, uh, it got to be 11.50. And I said, that's 24 hours. I'm getting up and eating another sandwich. And so I missed the heart of it. I, I think it probably did me some good because I did teach myself to say no. But the real heart is whenever you give something up, replace that time with pressing into God. Use that time for a different purpose. And so we encourage you. We're excited to be a part of what God's doing. You know, Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father do. I only say what I hear the Father say. That was not a, ro uh, a robotic statement. It wasn't even a I received instruction statement. It was a son saying, when I see Daddy doing something, I go and join him. And so as children of God, when we see our dad doing something... It's our responsibility, to, our, our opportunity to go and join him in what he's doing. So we applaud you for a, a sign up for that, and uh, we encourage you to do so. We've been talking about the five core values of Community Church. I want to uh, go over them again. I, I believe there's an overhead for you as well. I uh, want to think about what these five core values are and how they will impact us, especially in 2015. God wants to do greater things in our lives than we oftentimes uh, can fathom, can, can imagine. And the great thing about it is if it's bigger than what you can think of, you're probably just now starting to hear God. Uh, you know, because he does call us to great big opportunities and great big living, extraordinary living on a whole nother level. And so we want to be a people that understand what it means to live from heaven uh, as, a, as, a, as a people our first core value is that we live from heaven. Uh, Jesus prayed in the Lord's Prayer, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
And so we want heaven to be our template. So here's the easy way we look at it. Does this happen in heaven? If it doesn't happen in heaven, then we feel it's our responsibility to say it ought not be so in places I have influence. And so we begin to exercise our God-given gift of say-so. We call prayer. We get to exercise it and uh, pray and declare over situations uh, through our actions and deeds. And we get to live from the kingdom. We're not living for the kingdom because we're not performing. We're living from it because that's who we are. And because that's who we are, we get to discover uh, what it means to experience God's presence. This morning in worship is an, a- is an avenue that we experience God's presence. We want to experience His presence, experience God in everything that we do. We want to experience God's presence in the morning when we wake up. We want to be able to wake up and just know God is with us and be ever aware of His, His presence at every moment. When you're driving down the road, when someone cuts you off and that little vein in the side of your neck begins to pop and the, your face flushes, just remember God's with you. God's with you. Uh, remember when you're in the, in the line at Kroger and they forget to hire checkers for that night and you're in line and it gets too long or maybe it's a different business, sorry if it's Kroger, a uh, different business and you're a little frustrated, remember God's in that line with you. Take advantage of that. Experience His presence. Experience God uh, through worship, through good deeds, through actions where we begin to help people. You know, sometimes experiencing God for someone is because they received a card from you in the mail and it encouraged them. They get to experience God through you. We get to discover our identity. We get to begin to understand who we are as children of God. One of the great problems that the church has is we do not know who we are. And so we're, we're beginning every day to discover who we are in Christ. And that's the reason you'll hear us say things like, we don't call people out, we call them up. Our job isn't to talk to people about the, uh, the sin in their life per se. Our job is to talk to people about how what they're doing may not match their identity. And we want their, their actions to match their identity. So it's not that we sidestep it or don't talk about it. We just come at it from a different uh, direction for a different reason. Uh, we're not going to do it to, to shame people. We're going to do it to call people up. So we may talk to people about uh, the, uh, what they're doing, but it will be because of their identity first and foremost, because we believe God's called us to be his children. And as his children, there are certain things that happen in the family of God. Just like in your home, there's certain things that happen. Have you ever seen a child acting out and you thought, that wouldn't happen in my family? You ever thought that? Have you ever been to Walmart and saw a kid uh, training his parents? You ever seen that? And you thought, in my family, they weren't, we wouldn't do that in my family. Well, that's what the family of God is. There's times we go, hey, that doesn't belong in the family. That's not in our family. And so uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. The other thing that we begin to talk about is today is a, being a reconciling community. What it means to bring people to God. And I, I believe that today's message could be life-changing. Uh, and I don't say that very often because I don't always, uh, you know, you say it too often, then every message is life-changing, then no message is life-changing. Uh, but I believe that today's message, if you'll hear it the way I believe God has is, is talked to me about it. So I want to encourage you to really listen because it will affect everything we do in living on mission, loving God, loving others, and making disciples. Being a reconciling community matters. And it matters because we have a reconciling Father. And I want to challenge today, I'm telling you ahead of time, I will challenge some of the preconceived ideas of the church and of religion. Religion has been an enemy many times of relationship with God. The picture we painted, I want you to know that most of my adult life, I was a functional polytheist. Now, I wouldn't admit that because we're monotheists. We believe in one God, one true God. But I don't know if you're like me, but I really had trouble wrapping my hand around a father that was ticked off, a Jesus who came to die for me, and the Holy Spirit who was somewhere in the middle going, guys, to your separate corners. I had real trouble wrapping my head around it because I saw them as distinctly different in their nature and in their character. I saw a God of wrath. And I saw a, a, a Jesus, a Savior of mercy. And I saw a Holy Spirit of comfort. And I could not ever figure out what in the world this meant. And I would read all the theology books. I went, into the, I went to uh, uh, school for it. I began to preach about it. I knew I was supposed to love God. But I loved God because I was supposed to, not because I understood Him. 
I loved God because I loved his son. It was easy to love Jesus. Have you ever thought, boy, Jesus is awesome, but I'm going to stay over here when it comes to God. Well, maybe not you because you're maybe too holy for that. But the reality is, many times the way we're taught to about God, at best we have an abusive father. I want you to imagine how we talk to people about reconcil- uh, reconciliation. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, I want you to turn there and I want to talk to you about uh, reconciliation and what we're called to. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. O things have passed away, behold, all things are new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, I would read those scriptures and I would would see the beauty of them, but at the same time, I would miss many times the heart of them. Because my theology taught me that You and I had messed up in the garden that Adam and Eve had sinned, and because they had sinned, God kicked them out of the garden because he couldn't stand to be around sin. He had to kick them out. And then from then on, we began to have the law and everything else that that showed us how bad we were, and it was just a reminder that we weren't good enough. But finally, Jesus came, and he paid the debt for us. He satisfied the wrath of God for us, so that we could be saved, so now God could look on us once again. And that there, though there are elements of truth there, it is a skewed view of who God is. In fact, if we want to know who God is, Jesus came to reveal it. I want you to know that the Bible has been a continual revelation of the character and nature of who God is until it fulfilled itself in Jesus Christ. God fulfilled the full revelation of himself in Jesus. In fact, Hebrews chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 1 both say that Jesus is the express image of the invisible God. He says uh, that he is God in the flesh. He is the presence of God in our lives. So if you ever want to know what God looks like, look at who? Jesus. Now I want you to think about this. Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. He came to show us the heart of the Father so that we'd understand what he was doing. We were a world in desperate need of rescue. Yes, sin entered the world in the garden. Yes, Adam and Eve chose wrong. And yes, there was a separation. But why was there a separation? There was a separation because the love of the Father said to Adam and Eve, you will never be able to have a relationship with me as long as you carry that guilt and shame that you carry with you. When they ate of the forbidden fruit, they found themselves doing what? Hiding. They were hiding themselves. They were ashamed for the first time. They were too ashamed to be in the presence of God. And it was the mercy of God that said, this will destroy you. Every time I come around you, you are afraid of me. You're ashamed. You're ridden by guilt. So he says, you, you must go, and I will work on a solution to get you home. God has been working and work continually on a solution. In fact, the Bible says, before the foundations of the world, Jesus had the solution. He was slain before it was ever needed because he had a solution to the problem of our guilt and our shame. I want you to know that God is not rejecting us. He is pursuing us. He is a loving father pursuing those of us who are too afraid to be in his presence. But because we've been brought up in a broken system, we believe that we've got to get ourselves right before we can come to Christ. Have you ever heard anybody say that? If I walk in church, I'll split it plumb in two. I just, I'm too wrong. And the enemy uses this against us, and we think we've got to get ourselves right to get to God. 
I'm telling you, the Bible declares that yet while we were still sinners, he loved us and died for us. God loves you. Why? Because he chose to. He pursues you. Why? Because he wants you to be reconciled to his heart. God is not a distant judge sitting on a distant throne with a, a paper of guilt on one side and good deeds on the other side and decide whether they balance out or not. That's not the character and nature of God. And so we, we move forward and we get to the cross. And the Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians, Paul said through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that God was reconciling the world to himself. I want you to think about that. He wasn't having to get his mind right for us. He was having to get our minds right for him. He wanted us to be able to understand that he was busy working for us. Yet while we were still his enemies, he loved us. For God so loved the world. You know, there are people under the umbrella of Christendom right now, well-known authors, well-known pastors, well-known churches that do not believe that God loves the world. They take that and redefine it and say he doesn't really mean world as in whole world. It only means the elect. It only means these certain few. That's who God loves. That's who he died for. There's a doctrine called the tulip doctrine. And one of the, the L in the tulip doctrine is limited atonement. It is limited because he did not die for everyone. He only died for those who would be saved. Because otherwise he'd be a failure. They build an argument around this concept of victory and success. I want you to know the reason Jesus came was not because there was a limited atonement, but there was a fountain of grace and mercy that flowed from the throne of God through the cross of Jesus Christ and to the heart of every soul that longs to be reconciled to the Father. God has done his part. He says, he has reconciled the world to him. Why do you not hear community church? Someone asked me one time, why don't you talk about sin more, pastor? I want to hear more about sin. I said, because you don't want to hear more about sin. You want to hear more about what those other people do, but not what you do. That's the real issue. We, we, we don't help it at all to stand on street corners and say, God hates fill in the blank. We don't want to make one difference because God does not hate. God is love. He loves. He loves. God looks at our lives, and it says he has been busy reconciling the world to himself. The world includes everyone. There is not one human soul on this earth that God hates. Not one. There is not one beyond the possibility of redemption. It is only people that need to know the good news that Jesus Christ has paid the way when they needed it paid. They need to know that Jesus Christ has made the way that they needed made, that they can now come to the Father. They can be reconciled. Notice what the author says. It's, now we implore you, be reconciled to God. He's done his part. Will you do yours? Will you recognize what he's done and come to him? A world in desperate need. Jesus came to rescue us. I want you to think about that. Jesus came to rescue us from a broken world uh, in the sway of the devil. In 1 John, chapter 5, uh, 1 John 5, 19, it says that this world is under the sway of the wicked one. In fact, it says before we are believers, we are slaves to sin. We are in bondage. Jesus came to the cross not to satisfy the wrath of God, but to deliver us from the chains of death, sin, hell, and the grave. Jesus came to show us the victory in Jesus, the victory in the cross. There is no more sin in our lives because the Bible says we are dead to it. We need to live that way. He looks at us as his kids. He looks at us as restored. Why? Because he already paid the price. I want you to know he has paid the price past, present, and future. Now, before you say, wait a minute, Pastor, you're not turning into something else on me, are you? No, no. Because he paid it doesn't mean we don't have a choice to make. It means he sees us, he sees us in our perfection, and he's calling us to live in it. Be holy, for I am holy. Be thou perfect. Why? Because he sees the perfection potential of perfection in your life think about when god looks at you 
I want you to hear this. He looks at you and he sees the best you possible. He doesn't look at you with jaded eyes and go, oh, I guess you can come in. You said the magic word, Jesus. Now I've stuck with you. We think we're, he's stuck with us like an unloving father that just happened to get into the family. You know, there are people that live their entire lives thinking their family only loves them because they're stuck with them. What a shame we think that about God. God pursued us. He loves us, and he has been busy reconciling the world to himself, and then it fulfilled itself on the cross. I want you to think about the Old Testament, how God is a continuing revelation of himself. At first, we come in, and there's no, there's no instance of sacrifice in the Old Testament until Cain and Abel offer a sacrifice. They weren't told to. They just did it. You know why? Probably if you look in, in culture, everybody was offering sacrifice. Everybody was offering sacrifice. And so Cain and Abel go, well, we need to offer some sacrifice too. And so they offer sacrifice. And then you go a little further, and before long, you see all these people offering sacrifices throughout the Bible. And then, in fact, in Leviticus, I believe it's 28, he says, do not offer me sacrifices like you did to the goat gods, the goat demons, actually what he says. You offer them this way. See, God has always met us where we are. And later he says, the blood of, vo uh, of, volts, of goats and bulls do not please me. I do not desire your sacrifices. What I desire is love and mercy what i desire is justice what i desire is rightness you know what justice is biblically our method of justice and biblical justice are two different things and it has us confused we think of justice in the sense of punishment where they receive their just rewards they've been persecuted good we got some justice Biblically, justice is to make things as they ought to be. Make things as they should be. In fact, Jesus came as the Messiah, which in Hebrew is basically the one who brought justice, the one who made wrongs right, the one who made things as they ought to be. And what did Jesus come? He, he came from the day that he left the wilderness of temptation, and he began to say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God was about bringing, making things as they were supposed to be. Saving that which was lost. What was lost? Our ability to come to God without guilt. And so through the Old Testament, you would have these offerings that he, God would, in His grace, He said, well, I'll meet you where you are. It's not quite what I want, but I want you to be able to come to me. And especially on the year of atonement or when someone came in sin, they'd come up with an offering and their job was to bring this, this animal, and they were to make sure it was the right kind of animal, and then they would basically slit its throat and give it over to the priest, or the Levite in the case, and they would portion the animal out and begin to barbecue, basically, to uh, consume the sacrifice. And we get this picture of what we're supposed to realize about the cross. Can you imagine the first time you're there, and you've got to cut an animal's throat and see the blood released, and you know that's my sin that caused that death. Sinful man bringing an offering. Sinful man, in fact, in Acts, Peter in his first sermon said that God died by the hands of lawless, sinful man. We killed the Son of Glory. Because he showed us just how broken we were and we couldn't stand it. But thank God Almighty that the death could not hold him. The grave could not hold him. The chains could not hold him. Because on the third day he rose again in victory. That is the message of the cross. That it could not contain the life which is great which is good, which is pure, which is holy, and Jesus came to die as our substitutionary death. Why? Because we deserve to die. We were the ones at fault. He was the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world. He was slain to do something, to take away our sins. It was to satisfy us. It was to satisfy our guilt, so that just like in the Old Testament, when they would do that, they could go, shh. 
I can come to God again. That sin offering has made it so I can be a good Israelite again. It's always been about taking away our shame, our guilt. It's not about releasing forgiveness. It is about allowing the result of forgiveness, restoration. Because when you believe the other, otherwise, you build a system that says, God's requiring of me what he was not willing to give. We are called to forgive others, and we want to wait until they have earned it because we think God waited till his was satisfied. We are called to join God in the great rescue, the great conspiracy of God to redeem the world in his brokenness. God has been busy since the cross of letting the world know that he's made a way. Will you come? And the church has gotten in the way so many times because we think we have to fix people. We have to convince them of how bad they are before they will see how good he is. It's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. All we have to do is show the goodness of God. Now, the goodness of God is also the goodness which brings correction to us. You know, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. God is not easy on sin because sin kills his kids. He doesn't want it for us. But it doesn't make him reject us. It just says, you're believing the lie, son. Don't believe that lie. And so he's called us to be in this relationship where we join him in bringing about justice. How did Jesus bring justice? How did he break things right? His declaration of, I'm bringing the kingdom, the kingdom is near, is his way of bringing justice. Because we were designed, remember, you and I weren't designed to live in a fallen world. We were designed to live in his presence. And so you and I are wired, wired from heaven to live in his presence, and we will long for his presence until that day. And we will try to soothe it in different ways, whether it, it's drugs or alcohol or, or pornography or illicit other things, whatever. We try, we're looking for our heart's home. But Jesus said, this is what he is. I'm going to come and I'm going to bring the kingdom. And I'm going to show you what the kingdom's like. And I'm going to make things right. And I'm going to invite you into the kingdom of God. And as I invite you into the kingdom, you will begin to experience life as it was intended. And in fact, when he sent the disciples out, he said, you go and tell them the kingdom has come. The kingdom has drawn near to you. He called us to join him. And that great prayer of bringing heaven to earth. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God was busy reconciling the world to himself. He's called us to join Jesus in reconciling the world to himself. And he calls us, in 2 Corinthians, ambassadors. What are we an ambassador of? Are we the ambassador of the good news? The good news that God reconciled the world to himself and has made a way if you will only accept what he's done for you and, and move into that place of redemption where you can be translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, that he's, a, he's working in you and on you and through you. Are the one that says... You're so bad that God can't even stand to look upon you. But thank, thank goodness for Jesus that he can. And he died for you so that God could stand to have you in his presence again. And we wonder why the world looks at us and goes, I don't know if I want that, that father you keep talking about. Because we have shown the wrong picture of the father. I know this. There are parts of the Old Testament that I read that I have trouble seeing Jesus. And so I very honestly go to the Scripture and I go, Dad, I'm having trouble seeing Jesus there. I don't understand it yet. Now someone else may read that and go, well, I can tell you why, because this, this, and this. But it doesn't look like Jesus. And I've learned this in my life. If it doesn't look like Jesus, it's not the Father. I want you to say that. I want you, I want you to let that galvanized down in your heart if it doesn't look like Jesus you've missed the father because Jesus said if you have seen me you have seen the father 
In fact, he said he was about the Father's business every time he was doing good. He said, the Bible says in 1 John 3, 8, that for this purpose the Son of God was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. In Acts 10, verse 38, it tells us that he came to destroy again the works of the devil. Jesus was busy messing the kingdom of darkness up. And he's called you and me to the same. In fact, this is our call to be ambassadors. Now, I want you to think about this. Many times we ask ourselves, well, what do we do with this? How do we apply this to our lives? You are called to be a minister of reconciliation. I don't know what my call is. Yes, you do. You are called to be a minister of reconciliation. I don't know what I should do in the kingdom. I just wonder, should I teach Sunday school or be a small group leader? Or should I go into full-time ministry or stay at the plant? You are called to be a minister of reconciliation. Where you find yourself is really irrelevant. But the ministry of reconciliation is imperative. As a student, as a mom and dad, as a grandparent, as a boss, as a worker, as a leader, as a follower, your job, your call is to the ministry of reconciliation. And here's how it looks. You just start, I want you to write this down, start in a real small circle. Start the ministry of reconciliation in a real small circle. In fact, if you want to know what revival looks like, if you want to know what serving God looks like, if you want to know what the ministry of reconciliation looks like, go into your living room at your house or go to your bedroom or go to that place where you know you can connect with God and get out a little piece of chalk and draw a little circle around yourself. And say, Father, let everything that I've longed for start here. Let everything that I've prayed for start here. I've been praying for souls into your kingdom. I can't count on that preacher anymore. I want it to start here, Father. I, I, I've been praying for people to be saved and changed. I can't count on that preacher or preach well enough. So, Father, start in this circle with me. I've been praying that my kids would come home and they would, they would get their attitudes right. Father, get my attitude right. Start in the circle with me. Let me see you the way you are. You know, the greatest thing Moses had, Moses was going to the children of Israel to lead them. And I've talked about this several times in Exodus 33. When God said, I'll go with you, he said, I want to see your glory. You see God's glory the best when you see him face to face. When you will get into the circle called revival. When you will get into the circle called uh, an ambassador. And you will get into that circle of the ministry of reconciliation. And saying, Father, start here with me. Start here with me. We have too long waited on what other people will do. And joy begins to be sucked away from us like the very life because we're waiting on other people to fulfill that need in us. You can search in churches. You can search in scripture. You can search in denominations. You can search in religions. You can search high and you can search low. You can search in heaven and you can search in hell. But you will never find what was intended to be internal in the external. And what was intended to be eternal is a heart after his, a longing for the righteousness of God, a longing for the heart of the Father, a longing for the character of Christ that says, it will begin here with me. We are fooling ourselves if we're waiting for a move of God that will affect the community at large, but we will not allow it to affect our hearts at home. We have been praying for God to change our region but we won't allow him to change our conversation. Someone's not good enough. Someone's not holy enough. Someone's not this enough, or they'll do that too much, and we begin to wonder why we've lost heaven's perspective. At the point that you and I began to be frustrated, at that moment, we've lost heaven's perspective. I want to ask you, What's heaven's perspective in your life? What's heaven's perspective in the circle in which you stand? 
What is heaven saying over your life right now? Are you living out the ministry of reconciliation? Are you able to talk about the Father as the one who pursued you with his love? Who wrapped his arms around you and put a robe upon you and a ring on your finger and celebrated your return? Or the one that had to go beat up the servant first before he could do that? How do you think about your father? I heard a pastor say one time, the most important thing in your spiritual life is your view of the father. My daddy ran for me. When I was lost, and alone, when I was broken and I was breaking others, when I was manipulated and I was a manipulator, when I looked at people for what they could do for me more than what I could do for them, when I was in despair, my father searched for me. He left the 99 and he came after the one and he loved me and he restored me and he called me and he repositioned me and then a journey began where I still didn't know him. He knew me, but I didn't know him. All of my religion, all of my training, all of my limited experience with the church, because I wasn't saved till I was 18. All I knew about the church was TV preachers and my mom and dad's opinions. And I was strong. And I saw the father as angry with me all the time and disappointed. And I saw Jesus as the only one on my side, and I really didn't know what to do with the Holy Spirit, because you people are crazy. Have you ever been there? Has the enemy convinced you that the Father and the Son are not the same? It was when I discovered Jesus was the perfect picture of God that I had to begin to wrestle with that. And I can stand before you today telling you I'm in more love with my Father today than I've ever been. He's my hero. He's the one I want to be around. I want to, I want to talk to him. I want to see his will be done. I want to know where he's working, and I want to join him there because it's fun, because it's good, and because he's helping other people discover what I discovered. He's not mad at them. The Bible says he poured out his wrath. He didn't save any back. I want to ask you a question that was asked of me. How much more wrath do you want Jesus to take? Either he took it all or he didn't take enough. Either he took it all or there's a little bit reserved. How much, how much worse do you want it to be for Jesus to be good enough for you? He loves you. On the cross, he showed his love for you. And on the cross, he bled and died he died deserving the death we deserve at the hands of angry men in our place he died he died because he was so good it assaulted us and we could not handle his goodness any longer just like the little kids deal with at school every day and they're called goody two shoes or you think you're holier than thou We are not prepared to be around people that are good. It assaults us. And we react to it. And in that moment, hell laughed at us. And he said, good. God became man, and I got all kinds of ways to hurt man. But little did the enemy know that God didn't quit being God. And if this was Easter, it'd be a great message right now. Because the Bible says that Jesus descended into the lower parts. And he took captivity captive. And I want you to know in that moment, the Bible says that he led those that were in captivity triumphant processional. Meaning he walked in front of the devil. He walked in front of the demons. He walked in front of the lies. He walked in front of the detractors. And he said, you lose. You can't hold me. You can't hold them. You have no right on me, and I'm taking them with me. He loves you. He won for you. He won for you. He won for you. You are redeemed. You are called of God.
Jesus. Thank you for the victory. Thank you that you broke sin off of us. We're not slaves of sin any longer. We're slaves of righteousness. Father, I thank you that everyone that accepts your gift of reconciliation, your word declares that we're new. All the trash, all the old, all the broken, all the lies have passed away. And behold, all things are new. And Lord, we're not very good at living in this new life you've promised us. We have old habits and old mindsets, and I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you continually call me up when you have every right to call me out. Every time you've given me grace when there was a hidden sin in my life, and I was afraid that other people would find me out, you graciously worked with me. You changed me, Father, from the inside. Father, I thank you that you today are still leading captivity captive. You're still walking us in triumph. Today we are victorious because of you. Christ, the victor. May we walk in victory. May we lead from a place of victory. May we love from a place of victory. May we forgive from a place of victory. May we be what you've called us to be. And Father, there are people here today that don't know the victory you made for them. They hear it, but all the arguments in their minds are how bad they've been. Father, like the prodigal son, will you just throw your arms around them so they are melted in your love, so all their arguments go away. I thank you, Jesus that you submitted to the abuse of the cross, not at the hand of God, but at the hand of men. That sin lost its stronghold that day because I see it for what it is. I don't want it anymore. I'm tired of seeing abused kids. I'm tired of seeing... I'm tired of seeing the effects of the fall all around us. There's a world in desperate need of knowing the victory of the cross. And we join you, Father, in sharing the good news. That the victory is here, and the victory is not yet. There's coming a day, Father, where you will call us home. And all this will pass away. But until then, we join you in the great ministry of reconciliation. Calling your kids home. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you. Do you need to come home? If you're here and you need to come home, you need to come to where your heart longs for. You've tried the things of this world. You've, you've been apart from God. Maybe you've, you've been away from Him for a while. Today, I want you to know He's calling you home. Maybe you've believed some lies and thought you needed to clean yourself up. Well, today, He's telling you, I love you. You can't get clean enough for me to love you more. And you can't get dirty enough for me to love you less. I love you. Today, that message is for you. You can be victorious when you follow the one that's victorious. Will you raise your hand if I can pray for you this morning? Father, you see these hands. And I pray right now, Father, that you'll flood them with love, that you'll flood them with mercy, that you will flood them 
with the power of redemption. I thank you that our debts are gone. The ransom has been paid. The victory is ours, that we are new in Christ. Father, I thank you for that. And today, Father, we stand on our feet knowing that today we stand in a circle a circle of new life, a circle of new beginnings, a circle of trust in your kingdom, a circle of ministry, a circle of reconciliation. Today, Father, as we stand, we celebrate you. I thank you for life. I thank you for newness. Church, will you stand to your feet? Prayer partners, will you make your way forward? And I want to invite you. If you raised your hand today, or if God's just talking to you about something completely different. Here's the great thing about being His kids. You can cast your cares upon Him because He cares for you. Don't leave here today with the same burdens you came in with. Allow His love to cover you because that's who He is. There's not one burden you have, no matter how big or small, that He doesn't care about because He loves you. Let's worship the one who sealed our victory, not only by the sacrifice of the cross, but by the emptiness of a tomb. We serve a risen Savior who's accomplished a great victory so that you and I could go out of here more than conquerors. This morning, will you worship Him like you're more than a conqueror? Amen? Prayer teams are open. Maybe you filled out a connection card with a prayer request on it. Or maybe you're just holding back. I want to encourage you. I'm about to dismiss, and we're going to pray, and we're going to go about our day. But I want to encourage you. If you've got something going on in your life, our prayer partners are here to do just that, to partner with you in prayer. It doesn't mean you gave your life to Jesus for the first time. But if you've got something going on, we're a community, and this is home. And I want to encourage you that there's nothing, there's nothing that the power of God cannot take care of. And so... After I pray, if that's you, I want to encourage you to come up here, get in line, and let's pray it out with you. Father God, thank you so much for everyone here, Lord, that it truly is a super Sunday because you have an extraordinary love and passion for your kids, and we're in that category. Lord, bless them this week as they move on and move forward into greater things. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you so much. God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed, give me vision to see things like you do, God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from, give me wisdom to know just what to do. I will love you, Lord, my strength, and I will love you, Lord, my shield, and I will love you, 